Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, or welcome if you are just joining us on HowlRound. My name is Andrea Asaf. I am the Artistic Director of art to action and proud to co-present the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation with Pangea World Theatre. And so excited to be live streaming this incredible conversation we're about to have on HowlRound. Um, if you are just joining us, uh, we have just had a wonderful, amazing, actually, workshop and masterclass with Diane Roberts. And uh, it is my pleasure and honor to get to facilitate a conversation with Diane about her work and practice. Um, I don't know if we have any uh, opening slides to share um, with uh, Diane's bio. Um, but we can also drop that information uh, in the chat if you're online. And um, I am just so excited to welcome Diane. Hello, Diane. How are you feeling Hello. after your workshop? I'm feeling pretty good, actually. It's so lovely to spend time with folks uh, in this work. I, I always, I always discover. It was, yeah, it was a beautiful process and I got to facilitate one of the small group conversations and we had a really deep and personal and meaningful conversation, you know, mm -hmm. coming out of the process that you led us through. Um, if you are not familiar, uh, if you're watching on HowlRound and you're not familiar with Diane's work, we're going to give you a tiny little taste of it, a tiny, tiny taste by showing you a clip of um, uh, Diane facilitating a workshop at the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation, pre-COVID, of course, back in the summer of 2019. Um, and uh, if we can pull up the video uh, and get that ready when I see it pop up, um, we'll, we'll just play you a little clip. Uh, but Diane Roberts uh, has created a, a process and a project called Arrival's Legacy, which we'll be talking about today. And um, we will show the clip as soon as I get uh, word that it's ready. Let's see. And if not, we'll just start the conversation and then we can, okay. oh, here it comes. Oh, great. Thank you, Kayla. So we're gonna uh, just jump ahead, uh, just jump ahead to the section uh, with Diane leading. You can pause and- uh, Exactly for the rest over. of my life. Oh, we're gonna skip through, here we go. To be affirmed. <laughs> to keep you're seeing uh, uh, just opening some quick, up the doors and windows quick in images craft just the humanity in the room is going to change my bravery a moment where I looked around the circle and I felt like I loved every single person in the circle and was learning from every single person in the circle and that coupled with the fact that we are also different and we're from different cultures, different theater practices, different parts of the world um, felt very, very, very special to me. Okay, thank you so much for that clip. So you can see it was just a tiny, tiny bit to wet your whistle. And if you were in the masterclass that we just did in this digital space, you got to experience it in these little box as, <laughs> as you were saying, these little square frames uh, to the extent that we can, but it's so powerful when you're in the room and everyone is moving and singing together and exchanging and talking about uh, our relationship to ancestors. So Diane, um, I'd like to invite you to tell us a little bit about how did you come to this work? How did you find the Rivals Legacy Project? And mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what, what brought you to it? What was your process of creating it? Mm -hmm. Tell us about well, that history. Yeah, it started actually in 2003 in Montreal. <laughs> I had been invited to be an artist in residence at Concordia University. And um, part of my, um, my 
job there was to teach the intro to acting class. And um, at the time I was, uh, I, I, I knew that the program was quite diverse. Um, everybody who wanted to do theater in whatever form needed to take this class. Uh, so there were designers, et cetera, who were not in, not used to performing. So I thought, well, what, what would I, what kind of an exercise could I offer people that I might have wanted to do when I was in theater school? And, uh, and so I, I invited them to research their ancestor two or three generations away and to embody a compelling moment in their ancestor's life. And I thought, oh, this is just a three unit exercise that will teach them about character development because they were, they were meant to do a, a deep research into this character, their ancestor, and to present them without speaking. So I asked for a compelling moment um, and they could say up to three words and they could have three objects in the space. And this was an exercise about presence. How do you tell a story without the blah, blah, blah? So it just became a really profound exercise for the students. They found that the ancestor they chose was an ancestor that they really needed in that moment. Um, the research that they were doing through conversations with family members and also um, uh, delving into archival materials was just like mind blowing for them that they could actually personalize a historic moment um, and that their ancestor was part of this historic moment. And for students of color um, or indigenous students who were going through the program, it really gave them a place to land their feet. And this was something that was really important to me. I, I found that um, artists of color, indigenous artists that would come out of theater schools, theater training programs would be very well-trained, would be able to stand well and deliver their uh, monologues with truth and depth, but they weren't in their own bodies. So I would often in my rehearsal or in my um, audition rooms, I would often take them through uh, some exercises to get them to stand in their own feet and to imagine that character in their own bodies. Um, <clears throat> so, so that, that uh, training that I did in, um, in the uh, university um, uh, theater program, I, I took to uh, another, um, another program, which was a uh, cultural production workshop. So I started working with artists um, who were more advanced in their craft um, and, uh, and then started uh, delving more deeply into what this process really was. And that was about 18 years ago. Wow. So yeah. that, this is a long history of work, 18 years. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When I took over the company uh, Urban Ink Productions in Vancouver, I started working with Indigenous artists and racialized artists from acro across the country, researching this process and trying to figure out how we can source stories from our ancestors in a, in a responsible and also um, deep and uh, generative way, so. There's so much in what you've said already. One of the things that you mentioned um, actually came up as part of our conversation in our breakout group, which was uh, that you asked people to work with an ancestor two or three generations away. And we thought that was interesting because um, clearly perhaps we're too close to our parents <laughs> or the recent memory <laughs> of uh, dealing with our parents and um, all of the love and challenges and, and perhaps loss of that. And so I'm curious about like, how did you, how did you come to decide at least two or three generations uh, in the past? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, that's the beginning place because people choose an at the, the right ancestor, whether they're two or three generations away or not. Um, but the idea was that they were distant enough that uh, the person may not have known them. Um, and they also could tap into a historic moment that people are not necessarily familiar with or haven't lived. So there was something about the seeking 
um, there's something about time in that seeking. But I myself, when I did the the process for myself, I worked with my grandfather because my grandfather wasn't married to my grandmother when my father um, was born and he died when my father was two. So my father never knew him. Um, so for me, the unknown that like my lineage stops at my grandfather um, and trying to find more about him um, has been uh, a journey. <laughs> um, but it took me to the knowledge of my Garifuna history and uh, heritage, which is- Yeah, um, so that, well, I want you to talk more about that, but I also, how do you work with the unknown? How do you work, like for those of us who are, you know, part of a diasporic community that is perhaps uh, where there's loss of knowledge of where our people come from or how they got here or when, um, how, do you, how do you approach the unknown in this work? Well, I think we embrace it. We we step into the unknown. So people often say, oh, I don't know enough about this ancestor. And I say, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm, okay. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I try to encourage people to go with what they don't know instead of what they do know. Um, the, the knowing is really useful, like to having the knowledge and being able to source that knowledge is really useful, but sometimes it can be a block to other deeper knowings that are not um, accessible really through the more traditional ways of seeking knowledge, like researching in a book or going to a library or going into an archive. And we know that uh, for our peoples, the archive is a really violent place. So interpreting those archives as well and, and looking in the, the sort of hidden places where the stories might come out, um, those, that can be a really challenging process. But I, but I think the process is about our body knowledge and the memories that live in our bodies and trusting that wisdom that has been handed down through the generations. You know, science is now finally caught up with indigenous knowledge you know, with epigenetics, they're now saying as if they've discovered it, oh yeah, you, you carry the uh, genes and memories of your ancestors, but those stories have been in our cultures forever. Like, you know, how we pass on knowledge is, is not just through the blah, 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 but it's how we carry and the gestures we have. And that's, I think what was, has been so exciting about this process is, is revealing and uncovering um, that fact that we can access the unknown things. Like my grandfather, I, 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 could, I could go into deep depression and say, I, I can never connect. I will never connect to who he actually was. Or I can go inside and say, well, who he actually was is also in me. So where, in what parts of my body or what parts of my being still carry that uh, that epigenetic knowledge, I guess. That's incredibly um, helpful uh, way as I think artists to give ourselves permission yes. to, go, to go there and to search in that way. You were starting to talk about uh, your, your heritage as a Garifuna person. And mm -hmm. for folks who maybe don't know a lot about Garifuna culture and people, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, um, the Garifuna peoples were born in St. Vincent and there's different um, uh, origin stories that, uh, so that cycle about how they were, they came to be. They're an indigenous peoples, um, part Arawak and part um, African. And so uh, one of the stories is um, Malian traders uh, coming down the Gulf Stream met with indigenous folks and there was trade and, and exchange and people made families and, and such. And so uh, they were called the Black Caribs by the British. Um, so, and then of course there's the slave ships that started to come. Um, one was marooned on the island. So it, the, the maroon story is also a part of the um, of the mythology that is uh, the origin story of the Garifuna, but nonetheless, they were differentiated um, 
from the red or yellow Caribs by the British called the Black Caribs, and, and they were exiled um, at the end of the 18th century because they were warrior peoples and they were a threat to uh, the colonial regime. So they were exiled and most of them died off before they were, um, they were exiled just off the coast of St. Vincent and, and an island called um, Baliso. And then most of them died off because there was nothing on the island, um, no fresh water. And, but those that survived were dumped in um, uh, Roatan in Honduras first, and then they spread through the diaspora. So they're mostly in Central America and there's still communities that, of people who stayed and went underground. So there's a cultural reclamation happening right now in the Garifuna um, communities and traditions in the diaspora and home at, in St. Vincent. I actually um, met a Garifuna community in Belize, in Belize yes. uh, when traveling there some years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there are, there are communities spread around Central America. Right. Um, thank you for that history. That's um, that's really important for us to know, especially the way that you know racism, racism, and colonial systems of racial identification or segregation really, um, you know, create these histories of diaspora. That's right. um, in so many ways. In addition to the slave trade itself, then in so many ways throughout the Americas. Um, so here's a topic I want to raise uh, that you and I have had conversations about before, <laughs> um, uh, because I often, uh, at, you know, at the Institute, um, you're one of the artists who is really strongly rooted in uh, this um, practice of calling upon ancestors and connecting with ancestors to create your work, to devise new work, contemporary work. And there are other artists um, who in, in various ways, artists of color in different communities and traditions that are doing that ancestor work. And I'm a person who finds that work particularly difficult for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. One, because uh, I'm you know mixed race and heritage. I'm white American on one side of my family and Arab American on another side, Lebanese specifically. And, uh, and also because I'm queer and mm -hmm. um, lots of communities historically have rejected queer folks. And so um, calling upon my ancestors or connecting with my ancestors for me feels really difficult. It feels like it invites um, these histories of, um, you know, definitely oppression of LGBTQ people and rejection from community, but also um, I, I don't know what my white ancestors did Mm -hmm. in, on this land and perhaps I'm afraid to know that right or right. to investigate that so so this is the question what do we do with those difficult ancestors that we are afraid to call into the room or maybe don't want to how do you work with them well I think you work with who you feel called to work with at any one given time and um and I think that um those difficult stories will come out uh, when you're ready or when when they're ready as well. Like there's, it's a relationship where, where, where I always speak about forging a relationship with our ancestors. So it's not that we have to take on the whole body of our ancestors now that we're opening these doors, but I'm, it's interesting. I'm working on a project right now um, called the Art of Peace Arrivals and um, it's uh, with uh, uh, my collaborator, Jerry Trenton. Um, and we've been, um, we did an, we started the work. It's a, a, a piece that's being created with um, uh, five dancers, uh, contemporary dancers. And they're all, they all took uh, the Rivals Legacy workshop and they're explore, they explored their ancestors in different um, ways. Um, and so I think your question has sort of prompted or reminded me of a conversation we had yesterday as we were working together and, and this idea of the art of peace and, and peace, like war and peace in our ancestry and how we, how we can reconcile 
uh, our, our own sense of self as well with our ancestors who may not have approved of our lifestyle. So how do we call our ancestor into be in relationship with us when they may not have, like that we may be at war <laughs> basically in terms of how we choose to live our lives or how we are in the world, how we, how we understand ourselves in the world and how they did. Um, and so how do you sort of navigate those, those um, that relationship? And I think the reason why I start with a gesture of joy I always start with the gesture of joy in the work is that that is the bridging place. It doesn't matter who they are or were and who I am or will be. This bridging moment of joy is, is inherited and, that, and that's a place to start. And then we build on the complications and the layers of our relationship. Um, but what what came up in the conversation was um, uh, one of the artists was talking about how uh, he felt that his lifestyle would would have been judged by his grandmother, but that he, in that moment of of meeting her, felt such an opening, such an a, an opportunity to bridge you know to to i don't know there's something <laughs> there's something about um the mel melting away of some of those um things that we think will be will, will keep us apart from each other mm -hmm. and the same thing happens in the workshop between people and in our small group it was really beautiful when somebody talked about uh one of the participants talked about um feeling that all of our ancestors are actually in dialogue with each other, that we're all in the room and that she feels that my ancestor is her ancestor mm -hmm. and et cetera, you know? So there's, so there's the potential for reconciliation in a way that I think um, we can't talk about, like we, we can't. That we have to explore, we have to embody. And yeah, but yeah, yeah, that it's, yeah, that we have to embody and explore, exactly. And it's moment to moment, like it's not, okay, reconciliation done, we're done, we're, we've, we've figured it out and now we're, you know, but, but it's a process of unraveling oneself and one's own understandings, I guess, of, of what that relationship could be and might be. You mentioned um, epigenetics and um, some people might talk about cellular memory, for example. Um, do you always um, work with, do you always go for uh, that place of memory or do you sometimes allow people to imagine an ancestor? Because um, I, I appreciate the depth of research that's in your work. I think that's really important and that, um, that personal connection to a historical moment that you were talking about, I think is something that I love to see in, in artistic work. But then I'm also curious about, do we get to choose our ancestors or do we get to imagine who they might've been? And what's the responsibility of representation when we go to that imaginary place? Yeah, that's a really super great question. I mean, I, I think uh, it came up uh, in the workshop today, this idea of permission which comes up a lot in the in the process. People think, oh, I, I feel a trepidation around um, not telling or not honoring their ancestor by, you know, imagining these these uh, these moments. Like you imagine them open and you you put yourself in the shoes of your ancestor and imagine how they might have reacted um, in in this particular moment. And much of it is is using this imaginary space and uh, and letting your body, as I said in the workshop, letting your body open up the possibilities of thereness, you know, in a way. Um, and then and then you do it with such openness and 
and um, not uh, what's not not needing to find the thing, but needing to find the many potential stories that that could exist in and around this person because. We, we often think of, oh, my ancestor was very angry. She was a very angry woman. And so she did this and this and this and this. Um, and so we think of it as this kind of solid frame of what this person was, but they were angry in this moment, but they were not angry in that moment. So, so there's all these different possibilities that we in our lives live, like I'm not always, you know, <laughs> one thing so I love, I love that idea of the many potential stories <laughs> um and uh it, it reminds me uh, i i um don't uh, remember the writer's name right now but there's a ted talk about the danger of the single narrative oh yeah it's chimamande yes yeah. yeah which is such a brilliant talk if you haven't watched it and you're out there you should like google it immediately after this the danger of the single narrative or single story. And so I love that idea of the, how we're breaking that those um, stereotypes or those single narratives that we're given by the, the legacy of colonialism. That's right. And, right, and by exploring, well, what are the many, many potential stories of, of this lineage, this person, this ancestor? That's very beautiful. Yeah, we often talk in the process, we talk about catching story instead of making story. So uh, oh. as witnesses, like we, 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 the idea of witnessing others, other journeys, others journeys is really important. So you're exploring your ancestor and I, I would be your witness and I'm catching your story by notating what happens, what happens in your embodiment you you lifted your arm and then I I I thought I smelled sulfur um, and then this happened and then and that you know so you're using your own as a witness you're using your own bodily sensations to imagine as well what is happening it's not just oh you lifted your hand and I and I didn't know what that was but you lifted your hand and I I felt a breeze go by and. And then somebody who's who's done the embodiment will say, oh, that's so weird because I was standing on a ship in that moment and I remember the breeze going by. So the, all these amazing magical things happen. Um, in that, that's the, so interesting how the witnessing becomes part of the storytelling, right? And then the storytelling yeah. becomes collective, yeah. not singular. That's, yeah. Yeah. It's a, a, a extraordinary way to build an ensemble mm -hmm. experience and process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's when the, those stories, the stories interlock as well. And uh, I always think about different planes happening at the same time. So we are in our circle while we're preparing our vessels, as I talked about in the workshop, we're preparing ourselves to receive the stories that are available to us, but that we don't have the tools yet to catch and understand. So we prepare ourselves for that. And we're preparing our ensemble to hold those stories and those spaces with each other. But then at the same time, our, the, on the ancestral plane, the ancestors are meeting each other for the first time, who may never have had the opportunity to meet that particular person, <laughs> you know? So they're also getting to know them, the, themselves and they're getting to know the descendants. Um, and they're get, and then there's the ancestors of the land and territory that we're working on that are also witnesses, and they're witnessing, you know, what's happening with this. So so there's this incredible sort of um, circularity, multiple circles, sort of um, interacting with each other, mm -hmm. and as we open our receptors to that reality, then we can start to really um get beyond some of the things that uh divide us in creative processes but also in other processes do you think that there's a danger of romanticizing like or earlier you talked about war and how do we make peace and you know for some of us 
war is a quite literal part of our history or our ancestors' history. Um, and sometimes our ancestors were in fact at war with each other, quite literally. And so um, how, you know, do you think there's a, mm -hmm. when, we're, when we're seeking to make peace with those histories and those stories and each other in an ensemble, um, I imagine you probably work with very um, diverse, multiracial, multicultural ensembles. Um, do you, what happens, like, do you think there's a danger of romanticizing the reconciliation or do you, um, do problematic things happen that you then have to stop and talk about uh, and say, you know, let's, let's have a real conversation about racism, for example. <laughs> How does that work in the, in, in, when you're, when you're working with an ensemble over time? Yeah, I, I, yeah, there are things that come up and yes, there is a danger of romanticizing, but there's something about seeking the truth and seeking deeper that, um, that keeps us away from that romantic I ideal. Um, one of the, thing, one of the um, parts of the process is uh, we, we negotiate protocols. Uh -huh. and, uh, this is a, a really important part of the workshop where people bring in objects or, um, or, or, or ceremonial actions or speech or song to, um, to protect or to find a way to gather us together as an ensemble, but also to protect us from malevolent ancestors or spirits that might enter the room. So everybody in every culture has, has these traditional protocols that come into play. And then we as contemporary people have to reconcile or understand our relationship to some of those cultural protocols that we may have inherited, but may not necessarily believe or, or adhere to. Mm -hmm. So there's negotiation that happens there. So I might have, um, something in the space that might be troubling to me um, that I don't necessarily want to deal with, like a religious object or, or text or whatever. But my ancestor, it was so important to them, a rosary or, or something like that was really important to them. So how do I reconcile my ancestors need to have a, ro a rosary as one of the protocols, but uh, but my own, um, you know, whole relationship yeah. to that. Yeah. Um, so that has to be worked out. And then within the space, how do we negotiate protocols that might be triggering for other people? A really great example is how to hold libation, which is often done with water or or alcohol mm -hmm. um, in <laughs> African and Afro-Caribbean cultures in the same space with uh, sage and, and the smudge. How do we do that? And what, what's been really exciting and extraordinary in this process is that for the most part, there has, never, there has rarely been a point where we, we have not been able to negotiate the protocols. And I'd love to give one specific example. Okay. Uh, participants have given me permission to uh, tell this story. There was one um, uh, participant who had um, her grandmother had come um, through Ellis Island and she was Jewish, <laughs> had come through Ellis Island. And then there was a Palestinian um, participant who was uh, embodying the moment of the Nakba when, yes. um, yeah, the, 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 the occupation. Um, and both of them were highly politicized artists, so they were trying to negotiate this reality. And there was one point where um, uh, the one the Palestinian participant wanted to put her grandfather's picture on the altar, and uh, the Jewish participant wanted to put a candle, but the only candle she could find <coughs> to honor her ancestor um, said "Made in Israel" on it. Mm -hmm. um, so. So there was discussion, and of course, being Canadian, um, the, 
um, there was a decision. Well, no, it's okay. You can do it. You can put the candle on. It's all right. It'll be okay. I, I imagine these things go down differently in the U.S. than they do in <laughs> Canada. <laughs> and and I and we had to take a moment as a as a group and say, well, is this is this a, a solution? Just to say, no, it'll be all right. Or is there something that we can find if we sit in the discomfort of these two realities? Mm -hmm. And so what they ended up coming to was to cross out Israel on the candle and say, and to write Palestine. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it seems like a silly gesture because it was still made in, in Israel slash Palestine, but it was but but these um, in that moment, uh, the Palestinian participant said, "Yeah, that actually is okay. That feels okay." And the the Jewish participant said, "Yeah, actually, my ancestor would be more than fine about that." And, and there was a moment of real truth, mm -hmm. <laughs> right in that moment, that one could not negotiate outside of that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. just. Like, what does it mean to sit in these difficult spaces and try to negotiate what it, what's right, what's what feels right to to me or to my ancestor? What is honoring of my ancestral line, but also the ancestors that are also in the room? Is it reminds me the story of um, you know one of the artists that I consider one of my mentors is um, John O'Neill, mm. uh, who passed away some few years ago. But, um, you know, he, one of the things I really learned from him is that people build solidarity when they're doing the work. Mm -hmm. That we don't actually build solidarity sitting around and talking about it. We yeah. build it when we're doing something together mm -hmm. and um, seeking truth and seeking resolution to a problem seeking to accomplish something a, or a goal that we hold together. And so that's that's what this reminds me of is that in the doing, in the making, in the creating, in the exploring and negotiating is where you know a path becomes visible. That's right. And so I wanna ask, um, I, so I feel like I'm getting a um, even more, uh, you know, I've, I've had the um, pleasure and honor of experiencing workshops with you. Um, and I'm getting a sense of what a longer ensemble process would be like in the exploring, researching, exploring, and devising uh, mm -hmm. of work. How do you direct this process after you've found these ancestors and found these stories and negotiated protocols and made all this, created these worlds, right? What's the role of the director? And do you, do you direct the work yourself? Do you collaborate with other directors? Um, it sounds like an enormous, beautiful, messy process. Yeah. <laughs> so then what happens? Yeah, it is. It is a messy process. And um, I think it, it can take what, what's interesting is that when people come in, uh, they come. They don't necessarily have a form or an idea that they um, that they want to explore. They just know that they need to explore this particular ancestor, and then and and I think that's when it's most successful for people if they don't have these fixed ideas. I want to write a play about so and so and so, but but they're just trying to figure out how to find this deeper creative voice that would allow them to tap into um, uh, more resonant sources. So that's, that's how that starts. And then when, that, when they come out the other side of the five day or 50 hour process, mm -hmm. um, they come out with um, more knowledge about their ancestors and more knowledge about themselves um, they come out with um, fragments of knowledge and potential pieces that could be developed in terms of, you know, pieces in terms of um, fragments of story or fragments of, or, or questions, many questions. 
and then through unraveling that, and it usually takes quite some time. Heather Hermont was my first um, uh, partner in the work, and, um, and she developed uh, her um, ancestral subject, who uh, was Esther Brandau, who's a, a, a Jewish woman who came to Canada um, disguised as a Christian boy. Mm and then was outed and exiled ultimately. And so she's just finished her dissertation after having worked with me in 2004, five or whatever. She just finished her dissertation, or she, she, a couple of years ago, she finished her dissertation on this ancestral subject. So it takes a long time to kind of process through what you want to do with this work, but she created a, an interdisciplinary um, work called Ribcage, This Wide Passage. And that process of creation um, had to unravel itself. She was a spoken word artist, but wanted to work in the medium of theater and video projection. But everything that was chosen to be part of this work was chosen because it was needed. It was needed for the telling of this particular aspect of the story. So that that's kind of how I work as a director is to um, unravel what, what then these story fragments need to, what home they need to find in order to find their fullest expression. And yeah, and many people go off and work on the pieces and work with other dramaturgs to develop the piece. And uh, sometimes I come in to, uh, sort of stir up the pot a little bit more. Um, I, it's a dramatur It's become a dramaturgical process for me. And even in my other work, the other directing work that I do, this process of deep knowing of self uh, becomes part of my process of um, of engaging with uh, performers and and creators. Um, hmm. Yeah, so I don't know if that answered the question. No, that it, it really does. Is it, it, um, it, it, this work seems to it go in so many, like it can go in so many directions to uh, mm -hmm. writing and dramaturgy, um, to you know, ensemble building, to creating a staged work that, that is directed. Um, you mentioned that you bring this process into your own directing work. Um, do you ever feel, uh, do you ever feel like, I guess this is my question. Do you always feel like you get to fully bring your process to a directing project? Or do you feel like there's some things you have to say, okay, I have to direct, I just have to direct this, but this isn't my process. And over here, I'm gonna do my process. And then I may or may not direct that. Or how do, how do those things meet or mix or not? Yeah, I mean, I think, the arrivals process to me feels like a calling. It's my, it's what I'll be doing for the rest of my life. Um, I'm, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm writing my PhD. I'm doing my PhD on what the hell is this process? Congratulations, so, that's yeah, great. Thank you. So I, I hope we get a book out of it. I hope we get yeah. a whole book. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the work, and then my directing hat or my directing work is also um, a, a major part. Like I feel most me when I'm in a studio working with artists and to realize a piece, but all of that bleeds in. So it's hard for me to separate out. Of course I can't, you know, they're not gonna be sourcing ancestors, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, if the piece is it's about some, you know, it's, it's about that kind of thing. I, I, I work with hip hop theater right now. So I'm, that's what I'm, <laughs> That's the piece that I'm developing right now, but there still is the opportunity to 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 really um, work with who we are as vessels and to and to unravel the stories that live inside. And when I'm working with the playwright uh, Omari Newton, when I'm working with him at, as a playwright, I'm working also on that level of um, so where is this character sourcing there? truth and who is this character and Legba is Papa Legba who's a um, a deity or an orisha in 
the Haitian tradition and Yoruban tradition. Papa Legba is a, is a character in the play. So one has to, like one has to grapple with the spiritual dimensions of that. Um, so, and I, and I get attracted to plays that, that have that dimension, that, that, that push be between planes of existence. Uh, and people seem to be attracted to, or, you know, grab, they want me when they're working on something that, and trying to unravel uh, these um, pieces that talk about spirit and, and body and, you know. And I think also what you're saying is so important for artists of color. Um, mm -hmm. I, well, I was going to say in the Americas, but probably anywhere in the world, um, given the, the the vastness of the the damage that colonialism has um, created globally, like just being able to to welcome our full selves mm -hmm. in in our bodies, in our skin, in our um, in the stories that, you know, maybe we're never told publicly in our family histories, uh, just being able to come into the room and work from our bodies and who we are is such a, um, a gift and a breath of fresh air. Uh, if you've been trained in a, in a theater system that, you know, centers European or white American uh, stories, methodologies, processes, belief systems, etc. Um, so, in that in that way, I see this like deeply personal and profound work that you're doing has uh, also this incredible political contribution um, for for artists of color um, to to bring them our full selves mm -hmm. to creative work and therefore create new work that has that we haven't seen yet. Right, when we, it isn't the same work as when we're trying to fit into the boxes uh, that the history of you know Western theater has created for us. Yeah, yeah, I think we're also always creating form as well as content. We're trying to create new forms or to source new forms or not new old forms, um, and that's I think how, why this work came to be in me is I. I I was always on this journey, even when I was in my undergrad in theater school, or especially, maybe I should say especially, I was looking for, well, what is my process? You know, I, yeah, 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 Peter Brook, yeah, 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 you know, um, and I love Peter Brook, but I get jealous because he got to go to Nigeria. He got to, you know, he got to play, um, and Grotowski got to play with, African and Haitian songs and you know it's just and so I mm -hmm. yeah I think we we're regaining our traditions our root cultural traditions this is what I say in the process it's part of the process is to to get in touch with that what are our root cultural traditions that can take us into other ways of working that are not the Eurocentric sort of form, I guess. Yeah, and what I love about what you're saying is that it's, um, you know, kind of breaking this false dichotomy of um, traditional versus contemporary. You know, the quote unquote traditional is very contemporary and it's always evolving and it's always being changed by the next generation of practitioners and, and artists. And um, just uh, because we are uh, trying to source, um, stories or materials or practices or aesthetics mm -hmm. from uh, from a history that you know has been often suppressed or not told um, it's that is feeding contemporary work and it's funny how it's like legitimized when it's um, you know by a white European artist or white American artist mm -hmm. and it's often not um, supported to the same extent when artists of color are doing that very same uh, experimental work, That's of, right. right, of looking at our histories and cultures and and creating contemporary work with it. Mm -hmm. I know just a few, oh, we're at time, I'm getting the message. I could talk to you all day, Diane. Um, I am so grateful to you for spending this time with us and offering your process, even in this very tricky and challenging digital space. And, and having this conversation, which just makes me want to 
know more about what you're doing next and how to learn from you and with you in the future. So can you tell folks before we sign off just a little bit about how do we find uh, what you're up to next and stay connected with your work as it evolves? Well, I'm actually just um, going to be launching a website probably in the next uh, uh, month or so called, uh, it's Diane Roberts. Um, dot me. <laughs> that's so right. fun. I just think that's so fun. Diane <laughs> Roberts at me. But um, I also have the Arrivals Legacy Project website. Uh, that's, um, that's up and you can reach me through that um, info at arrivalslegacy.com. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I, I wish that there was time to show a video of, uh, <laughs> of the project that I'm working on right now, but maybe I'll leave it in the chat or, um, yeah, Black and Blue Matters is a, a really important piece that is being done in Montreal and Ottawa, and that'll go up with Black Theater Workshop next um, next year and, uh, in uh, the spring. Um, send it to us, we can put it in the chat too. Okay, it's yeah. that sheet. Yeah, yeah we will uh, post it. I'm sure uh, HowlRound can post it on the website uh, with the interview and we can um, share it out through our Art to Action and Pangea channels as well. We would love to see that important work and hope I, I hope to have the opportunity post pandemic to be in the room with you again mm -hmm. and in a creative process again at the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation when we are able to convene again, which I know will be soon. Thank you so much, Diane. Uh, much love to you and many thanks to Lopa for co-facilitating today. And uh, it was a joy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Always a joy to talk to you. Thanks to HowlRound. And I think we might have a couple of closing slides. Yes. Um, we hope you will join us next time uh, for on May 15th as part of our monthly series, Dora Arreola will do the next masterclass and uh, we hope you'll tune in or join us and register for that. And we wanna thank um, our funders and of course Pangea and HowlRound as well for um, hosting and live streaming this incredible conversation with Diane Roberts and also um, the masterclass that preceded it. So um, look to hell around for uh, videos. If you didn't catch all of it, you can tune in later. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. See you next time, May 15th. Bye, everyone. Bye, Diane. Bye. Thanks, Andrea. Beautiful interview. Thank you.